Hey, I'm really excited now, folks, because we're going to do some more movie talk. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome to the show a friend of mine and uh, the writer-producer of the film The Bridge to Terabithia, Love Ludlow, and he's got a new movie we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, Dave Patterson joins me from New York. Hey, Dave. Hello, sir. How are you? Good. I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, too. This is the kind of friendship we have. We just uh, look at pictures of each other on, online, and I'll, I'll take it. I'll take what I can get. Well, we make fun of each other whenever we can. I, I, I will tell you <laughs> that uh, I chose not. Everyone knows I'm 30 years younger than you, but I chose <laughs> not to shave just to make you feel better. You know, Just so. to make it look like, give the appearance that you went through puberty. Is that what you're trying exactly. to say? Actually, okay. Actually. Oh, that works. I appreciate that. And actually, most of the gray hairs are in my nose and ears, so as long as I keep them trimmed, it doesn't look All like right. That. The camera option is optional. Just want to let you know that. Uh, yeah. Hey, it's great to have you, buddy. Are you guys getting this weather in New York? Is it? It's it's probably much mild, more mild there. We're well, like I just heard right, right before right I came now. on. It's minus three. That's yeah. what you guys were saying there. You know, minus three is you know only after a really bad fight with your wife. Um, here, you know, it's around <laughs> it's around twenty degrees right now. But you know, people yeah. still go screaming and hiding in their garages at, at twenty degrees. We actually did have <laughs> an ice storm tonight. And I had oh, to walk no. my wife. She's actually traveling tonight. I had to walk her, like two old people, to the car because everything was just a sheet of ice. And I got her in the car. The taxi guy wouldn't even get out to get the bags. So I had to go back. And I'm like shaking to get the bags into the taxi <laughs> to say goodbye to her. So, yeah, we so fall apart. We fall apart in this weather. Yeah, it's awful. And uh, your wife uh, getting a cab out of town. Everything okay? Anything you guys want to talk about? I'm surprised well, more no, people I mean, don't ask you, know, you for advice. You know, she, you know, it, everyone takes a break, right? After 35 years, sure. you, you know, now she travels a lot. She travels yeah. a lot. And so she wants to get wherever she's going so she can be up fresh in the morning to nice. get on the world. So. Well, you're, you're a very good husband and uh, I'm really glad to have you on the show, buddy. You have a new film called the girl who wore freedom. Tell us, uh, tell us about that. Well, interestingly enough, everything that's old is new again. And so this mm. film, uh, we actually, we, we finished it and did the film festival circuit about two years ago during the heat of COVID. So basically oh, every festival was canceled. We got into 27 festivals and won 26 awards, but you Whoa. know, it was really tough getting into the larger festivals. And so we went, we went with the streaming thing. It's actually been on Delta for over two years, which is really impressive to have a film on Delta airlines for that long. We're negotiating another one, but the film is about the 80th anniversary of D-Day. And okay. so I said, if it never was in the theaters, why don't we reach out to theaters? Because, you know, this is only going to happen once in our lifetime, the 80th anniversary. Right. And, and the fact is that at the 80th anniversary, there's still thousands upon thousands of D-Day veterans around, but they won't be for the 85th and there will be none for the 90th. Right. And, and so this film is uh, it's close to my heart. It's a documentary. Um, I also did a documentary called uh, Don't Start Don't Stop Believing Every Man's Journey. It was about the band Journey, which uh, had a great run. Um, I wanted but, to ask you about that, too. Yeah. Yeah. But, but this film, uh, The Girl Who Were Freedom, what people don't know about D-Day is they all know that 3000 Americans died basically during that initial invasion. What they don't know is 30,000 Normans were killed during the invasion. Hmm. Um, so you would think that we create a part of the world where there, we're not that popular. <laughs> the fact is, if you find one place that loves America more than America itself, it's Normandy. Really? Because we, uh, we liberated them after four years of occupation by the Nazi regime. And every year uh, around D-Day, Normans dress up like Americans. They play American music. They bring hmm. out. They bring out tanks and half tracks from World War II and have massive parades. They welcome veterans back to Normandy, take some of these veterans from D-Day into their own homes, feed them, house them, and thank them for saving their parents and grandparents 80 years ago. It's really- and this, is, this is all in the film? This is all in the film. That's cool. You see the girl in the background, that is the girl yeah. who wore freedom. On the first anniversary, 1945, where we were still in the thick of it, she wore this dress that was made out of American parachutes. Her mother made this dress, and she wore it for the first anniversary of D-Day. This young girl is still alive today, and she's in the movie, and she's interviewed. And all these uh, 
now grown-ups or and elderly people who were children during the D-Day invasion remember the friendships that they met and made with these American soldiers. And it's it's really a love story between the French and America. And it's it's really a wonderful thing. A lot of veterans don't want to go back to D-Day because of the things they saw and the things that they even had to do. And th these are gentlemen in their 90s with PSTD. And you see in the film, they go there and they are released. These people embrace them. They wow. thank them. And it's it's really a beautiful movie. In fact, the uh, president of Delta Airlines saw this movie. And then for the last two years, he's flown veterans of D-Day to Normandy for the celebrations every year. And uh, wow. it's a movie I'm very proud of. And so I just started making phone calls to theaters throughout the U.S. And we're booking it because people are like, of course, we should show that. Now, we're not going after the massive chains. We're going after the mom and pop sure. theaters. They own like four theaters, but that's like 30 screens. So like, yeah. of course, we'll put it in, in one of our theaters to, to honor because they have veterans in their town. And it's not just the D-Day veterans, but there's veterans in every town. Oh, sure. And this is an opportunity to honor not only those from World War II, but from Korea, from Vietnam, for those that are serving and are currently serving. And it's it's just, it's a love letter to the military, but also when America was really at its finest. And we, yeah, don't, we don't appreciate that enough. What would, uh, my guest is David Patterson. He is a movie producer and writer. And um, what was it like? Oh, that must have been, it, do you have to really talk these guys into going back there, Dave? To, to I, Like you said, some of them don't want to go back. What is it like when they get there? Well, you'll see actually in the film, there was a man who really, <clears throat> I don't want to say we dragged him kicking and screaming, but he went very, with very, very, deep concerns because he sure. was at St. Lowe, which was leveled during the war. It literally was a place where the Germans were not going to budge. And so yeah. we Americans had to pretty much take out the entire. And he told a guy, he goes, I, I, I can't go there because I know what happened there. And he met a woman who was a child at St. Lowe and she hugged him and she said, thank you. She goes, thank oh, wow. you. She goes, Thank you for giving me my freedom. Thank you for letting us live in the world that we live in today. She goes, I know what happened at St. Lowe. I lived there. I saw what happened. But you weren't there for that. You were there to save us. And this man, by the end of the night, he was singing. He was dancing. He, You could see the pressure left off his shoulders. This 90-plus-year-old man who went there shaking like a child was dancing. I mean, it's wow. an incredible thing. It's an incredible, incredible, powerful movie. What, where can people see that? Like you said, you're going to do theaters. Are you waiting to put it out on streaming? Or can people stream oh, no, it? No, it, it actually is streaming. It, okay. it, it is on, it's called The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Okay. It's currently on half a dozen platforms. Um, so uh, again, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. And uh, I, I, of course, should be telling you exactly where it's available. Um, you know, I, I should be able to whip that out right away. Well, you um, can probably search it on Roku too, though, if you want to. Absolutely. I'm just looking at your IMDb page here too, and all the wins from these film festivals. This is incredible. But you know what? Wow. That's not just me. There's actually a lot of really good, talented people. No, that, no, no. Uh, it's all you. It's yeah, all no, you. No, no, you know, if you look at the words closely, it doesn't say Fort David Patterson. <laughs> usually, <laughs> I remember you said you wanted to pull a uh, Tanya Harding on the other filmmakers, and that's fine. You know, take some. Glory. Well, I almost did that for you at Stony Brook because uh, actually, Stony Brook. Be that's. That's the festival we met at. You, I was there with the Godfather Green Bay. You had Love Ludlow there. Yep, yep, and, yep. Uh, yeah, and you, I wasn't feeling well, and you said, come on, man, have a beer. We, we have he a was film. In the, he was in the corner drinking by himself like this, and I said, <laughs> dude, you got a beer. Cheer up. You're in a festival. Come on. Let's have a good time. He said, you need friends. You can't be a recluse your whole life. And then we hung out at the Chateau Marmont once off Sunset Boulevard, which we were both really thought that was cool because that was where, well, a lot of celebrities go, but that's where John Belushi died, sadly. And then you well, came to Madison. We didn't go there to die. We didn't go there to die. We actually no, just no, went no. There to have a couple of drinks. And, and uh, we were open to it, but yeah, yeah, it was just, it was just a nutty night out on the town. You never know what can yeah. happen. So yeah, we were young, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, okay. So you talked a little bit. We got to do a break in about 60 seconds, Dave, okay. but tell us a little bit about your, your, uh, documentary about Journey. That was interesting because Steve Perry had left the band and we'll save Bridge to Terabithia till after the break. But I thought that was a really fun movie, The Journey. And and the, the story about how they found their new lead singer, Arnel Pineda, I think yeah. was his name. Ar Arnel Pineda. They found him on the internet. They they actually, 
the lead guy, Neil Gorshin, I probably had that wrong, uh, from Journey, he Googled lead singer Journey. And this guy popped up on this grainy video in the Philippines, basically singing in, in, in a bar. At, but one, what was unmistakable was this voice, which was almost identical. It's a great voice. Yeah. It's an incredible voice. The guy, the guy's like five foot nothing, but he jumps off the piano. I mean, you know, he, he's incredible in performance and then performing in larger stadiums that they performed of than they did in the eighties. So, yeah, wow. it's, uh, and he, he's and been their lead. That made, ahead, me a cool dad. that made me a cool dad. Cause I was able to take both my boys backstage at a journey concert to meet a band, you know, all my other stuff they're like, Oh, who cares? You know, but uh, this, they got to go backstage and meet a rock star band. So. I remember I saw that. And then I saw them performing on Oprah. Yeah. I watch Oprah. I wanted a car. And uh, he was great on that, but we have to do a quick break. My guest is Dave Patterson. We're going to talk a little bit more about this journey uh, project he did that was out a few years ago. There's a really good film. Very interesting. And then uh, we'll talk a little bridge to Terabithia too. Dave, great to have you here. My name is Peach Waba. This is Nightlight on the Civic Media Radio Network. Welcome back. The movie is The Girl Who Wore Freedom. You can stream it uh, according to this, Dave. I just Googled this during Thank the you. break. Voodoo, YouTube, Amazon, and Apple, all the heavy hitters. And then uh, where where can people see the Journey doc, uh, Journey documentary? See, I should know that too, right? It's actually on pretty much all those same streamers that you just mentioned. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, that's, a yeah. fun, that's a really fun one too. I recommend that uh, as well. Um, have you ever heard of the Doctors in Recital, Dave? I have not. They're going to be here in studio after this interview. So if I'm, I'm not saying you can get here in time and it sounds like your driveway is kind of slippery, but Very I wouldn't slippery. ask you to risk it, but right. they're great. They'll be along shortly. So, and so if, they, what and else? If, they, if they weren't listening, absolutely. I've heard of them and it's a shame. I'm not <laughs> going to be able to meet them. So you just tell them that. So. I will, I will pass that along. Um, so tell us a, a little bit what's next for you. And then let's give people some background on the bridge to Terabithia. I just want to say to the listeners too, this, this, irritated me. In fact, let's just jump into this, Dave. I had Dave booked to go to the Marinette School District and watch and give a talk. And I, I want to say you were going to bring your mom or try to or were open to the idea. And and The Bridge to Terabithia is a book every middle schooler reads. I read it with my daughter when she was in fifth grade. I was moved to tears several times during the book. It's so beautifully written. That's Catherine Patterson. That's Dave's mom who wrote the book. And I had Dave booked to give a speech in, in Marinette and something happened. I still don't know the whole story. I, there was some finger pointing. I don't know who exactly was responsible for it, but I I've never gotten over that as you can tell. Um, so it would have been fun to hang with you in Marinette, but it didn't happen. But give us a little background about uh, the bridge to Terabithia, if you would. Yeah. Well, I didn't think we got in because I think they heard about the trouble that you and I got into at Stony Brook and they just didn't want a, a remix right. of that to happen. They just didn't want we to went to the Chateau Marmont looking to possibly die. And they thought exactly, this was a exactly. bad reunion. You know, you know, to reenact Belushi. No one, <laughs> no one found that, you know, entertaining. Not the middle so, schoolers. So a lot of people, if you do the Google, the Wikipedia, you'll know that I am the son of Catherine Patterson and my mom wrote Bridge to Terabithia, but what, I think the vast majority of people don't know is that the book is based on me as a child. When I was uh, seven years old, I met who I really thought was my soulmate in life, even though I was only seven years old, but I just envisioned spending my life, the rest of my life with this girl. And tragically she died uh, nine months later. And the event obviously destroyed both families. Uh, the girl's name was Lisa Hill. It destroyed her family. It destroyed my family. And my mother, who had started writing, she had already published three books, um, was just devastated. And she tells people, and, and she's not embarrassed to say it, she said she wrote the book for herself and, and not for me. People say, oh, Catherine Patterson wrote the book for David. No, what she wrote it was try to figure out her grief and how to get through wow. it. And so uh, people say, well, how close were you and the character Jess? Pretty much identical. You know, uh, the Jess... Uh, was kind of afraid of his father. I was afraid of my father because he was a preacher. And I thought that if my dad worked for God and God took out my best friend, then my oh, dad, man. My dad probably wasn't too happy with me. And certainly the guys above weren't either. So 
I loved to run. I loved art. I was beat up a lot in, in, I lived in a tough neighborhood. Um, I was in love with my art teacher. So basically, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it, was, it was very, very similar. Um, we didn't grow up on a farm, but we were very poor. And uh, we grew up on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. And so, you know, there were many, many similarities. And when she finally finished the book, she took it to her publisher and said, you know, I don't think anyone's going to want to read this book. And the publisher read it and she said, everyone's going to want to read this book. Wow. And my mother said, well, I can't publish it without David's permission. Here she comes to me. I'm nine and a half years old. And she goes, um, can you read this? My publisher would like to publish it, but I won't publish it w without you know your approval. Now, asking a nine-year-old to decide the rest of your career is pretty <laughs> crazy, uh, but she was willing to do that. I read the book, and she said, "What'd you think?" And I said, "You know, it was tough." I said, "But you got the uh, dedication wrong because you just dedicated it to me, and it's not my story. It's it's Lisa and my story." So if you look at the book and read the dedication, it says, I wrote this book for my son, David, but after reading it, he told me that it's his and Lisa story. And so that in the credit, she goes to Lisa and David Banzai, which in uh, Japanese, it means may you live a thousand years. And interestingly enough, the book is almost 50 years old. And if we don't oh destroy ourselves gosh. on the planet, it may last for another thousand years. Who knows? Oh, but it's, yeah. But, you know, it was a, obviously a very important book for us, our family, both families. Um, I was very ashamed of it for many years because we grew up poor and suddenly I had new shoes. I wasn't wearing my brother and sister's hand-me-downs. We were eating meat four times a week as opposed to one time a week. And the only thing I had to give up was my best friend. And that's oh, how you look man. at it when you're nine years old, right? And so yeah. I, was not, I was kind of ashamed of the book, even as it got more and more successful. My brother used it to meet girls. He was older, so I understand that. <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, I even my wife, when I met her, I didn't mention the book, although she had read it, adored it, and loved it. She didn't find out until years, many years into our relationship that my mother wrote Riz Teravithi. It was something I did not oh, advertise man. or tell. But when um, I started writing, making movies, I, I said, if someone's going to make this movie, it should be someone who's going to protect it, who's going to protect the legacy, the history of the family. So it's going to be me. So when people ask me how long it took to make Rich Terabithia, I say about 20 plus years. And it's not because I was lazy or tired or misplaced the script that many times. <laughs> it was because I would have people with a lot of money come up and say, give us the property and go away. And I just right. Wouldn't do that. I just wouldn't do that. I said, that's no. That's what they do, right? Yeah. That's, that's what they do. And and they said, you know, I said, no, I'm going to be the writer and I'm going to be a producer. Because I knew that if I was just the writer, they'd dump me in a heartbeat, which they did after they bought the property. But since I was still a producer, they couldn't shake me loose. So I literally was there fighting tooth and nail to get the final story of what you see in the movies now. And people will say it's very close to the book. Well, that was the intent. And, yeah, but it wasn't necessarily fun the whole time. Making movies isn't fun. Pete can tell you that. Here's you know? what we got. OK, here's what we have to do. I I'm basically out of time already. And you have so many funny stories about writing it for the studio. Can you come back next Tuesday night for like the same amount of time and we can pick up there? We'll turn this into a little mini series, if you don't mind. I'm, I'm sorry we ran out Absolutely of time. Absolutely. No, no. I'm look, I've been married 30 years. I've been told time's up all the time. So, you know, it's, uh, and, and then I'm giving another chance down the road. So this is, yeah. this and is I want to talk more about love Ludlow too. Cause that was a great, but I just want to say, Dave, I, I, I didn't know that about you when we first met either that you had this connection to the book, but there's a passage in the book that just literally makes me tear up every time your mother's writing is so beautiful. You did a great service to the movie and preserving that. And I, I, I hope you can come back next Tuesday night and talk about your experience as a writer producer with the movie, if you don't mind. I'd love to. All right. Fantastic. Thanks so much, buddy. We'll talk to you one week from tonight. David Patterson will be back. So you won't want to, his stories about writing the movie are so funny. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks, um, Dave. Coming up in just a few minutes, the doctors of recital, Dave Patterson's favorite band. They will be here in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm Peach Waba. You're listening to Nightlight on the Civic Media Radio Network. <laughs> 